Let me, Let me tell, tell you a story. story. It, it was at the end of a class period, but really quite near the beginning of the semester. When I noticed a young woman back there, and I saw her eyebrows were clenched. She was tapping her desk a little bit nervously. And I could see that there were questions in her eyes. Because I've been teaching communication studies for about 15 years, and I've seen that look before on other faces in other classrooms. We had just been reading a book, actually some of you may have read it, it's called The Path to Hope, written by two young Frenchmen, 94 years old and 90. It, the book is really a manifesto, calling us to reclaim deeply held human values, respect, and dignity. And it's a call to action, to look at what is it that we need to do to create the community well-being that we want and get rid of the injustices that persist. So the young woman, she raised her hand and she said, I'm ready to talk, okay? She said, I was filled with hope and I was inspired as I was reading that book and isn't it a little too idealistic? Really, what can I do? She started to tell the story about how her parents had been whipped by the harshness of the economic downturn and how, as a result, she was going to school full-time and carrying two jobs. She was struggling to keep up with her classwork because her education previously had been impersonal and devoid of community making. So she said, really, what can I do? And, any, and anyway, isn't technology supposed to solve all our problems? What can any of us really do to change all of the problems that we have in the world? And I said, conversation is the starting point. In our cities, we have these great streets and sidewalks that take us from place to place. But our conversations also move us. With the homeless man, with the nanoscientist, mm -hmm. with the performer, with the activist, when we all come together, that's when ideas really bubble up. And that's when we can figure out how to solve our problems. And that's how we can usher in social change to deal with the issues of the day. <coughs> our city tells us as much. We have a rich history here, and actually our nation too. We know throughout history, social change has come about because of conversations. In 1920, women got the right to vote. Now, it took 100 years of conversations. <laughs> and the eight hour workday, we signed that into law in 1937, but it was really a conversation that was started by two Philadelphia carpenters 150 years before. In the 1950s and 60s, civil rights swept the nation, and no more so than here in the South, and we saw the effects of conversation and action to address racial inequalities. And of course, four young men from North Carolina, North Carolina a and State University had conversations with community members and in their dorm room, huddled around their desks. They summoned up the courage, they walked downtown, they sat at the lunch counter and sparked a nationwide sit-in movement that changed a lot. <coughs> In 1990, finally, we had the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, and of course, that allowed for the inclusion of a great number of people in our community. And in 2006, right here, we issued the final report of the country's first Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that project was led by courageous and committed people who said, we are ready to have the conversations, the painful conversations, about our history. We are ready to have them so that we can talk about race, labor, and justice. Conversation is the starting point to engage on meaningful issues that affect us in the public sphere. Now, this is a political point for me, but it's also a personal one. <coughs> As you heard, my parents lived in Serbia. 
And after World War II, they couldn't have a conversation there anymore. Free speech was squashed. But they wanted to talk. And so they left their country, and separately, actually, they didn't know each other then. They made their way to America, and once they got here, they were confronted once again with some obstacles to speaking. And this time it was for the lack of English fluency. My dad was a farmhand. His first job was as a farmhand. And when he wasn't working, he sat by this radio for hours, listening and listening, and finally taught himself English. It would be his fifth language. My mom also learned and mastered English. And then, of course, they started having conversations. My dad particularly enjoyed talking about truth and freedom, these core democratic values that he held deep in his heart. And they also had conversations with me about the importance of education. I was the first one to finish college. They said, get your education, learn the knowledge and the skills to be able to speak out for what you believe, to stand up against injustices, and to ignite conversations. These were meaningful lessons for me. And yet, I look around, my students come into the classroom, and other community members as well, and I see them shying away from community conversations. They tell me, I don't know the issues. They tell me, I don't have the time. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And, what good will it do anyway? Well, I've dedicated my teaching career to showing people how conversation can create social change. My students come to my courses and we develop them in a way that they learn about communication by going out into the community and observing and engaging in conversations. What are we talking about? And what are the values that come forward as we're talking about those issues? And what issues aren't we having conversations about? And what are the values not coming forward there? Because I can tell you, if we're not having the conversation about an issue, it will wither away. Our relationships will do likewise. So my students go out into the community. They have conversations in public spaces with people and for people. And this is a point that philosopher Emmanuel Levinas says that is critical. For it is our conversation, our communication, that is the ethical expression of what it means to be human. It's a powerful move. It inspires big ideas, and conversation is really a small first step. So, in my classes, let me just give you an example. One of the things that we've been doing for many years now is taking our students over to Dudley High School, close by. And we're having conversations there. We read the newspaper together, and we talk about the issues, we talk about the articles in there, we talk about the letters to the editor, we talk about the editorials, and the students, high school students and college students, learn about their community, many for the first time. They also learn how people have different perspectives, and they learn to be respectful of that, and they learn about the wonderful features of conversation that include teaching us how to take turns, <laughs> to listen carefully, and to speak about things that alone we might not be able to imagine. So a couple of years ago, we've been reading the news, following the news, kind of increasing our knowledge of our community so that we could love this place. And they, the students that decided that they wanted to do more than understanding the news, they wanted to make it. They wanted to make the news. And so they zeroed in on an issue of, that affects our bus riders. And that is that there are too few bus benches and shelters in our community. Only one in ten bus stops has a bench. And far fewer have a shelter to keep bus riders away from the rain, the wind, and other harsh elements of the weather. 
And so what did they do? Well, they had, they, their conversation sparked creative activities that continue until this day. And the first thing they did is they started talking to other people, to bus riders. Oh, and let me just back up a second. In, at this particular high school, many of the families use the bus regularly. But for my college students, most of them, almost all of them, have never ridden the bus. And so they talked to bus riders, and my students became bus riders. And they talked to city leaders and civic groups and reporters, and they started creating exhibits, painting chairs and benches to put on display so that they could spark conversation. And they marched to make visible a community concern that had been invisible. And they raised money and awareness for their project that they called BUBS, bringing us bus benches and shelters. <laughs> yes, they stood at a bus stop with their umbrellas to demonstrate the need for shelter. Eventually, they got their first bench installed. They raised enough money for that. And they continued to do the work. They raised more money, $2,000 for more benches. And the local group Synergy took note. And then the, the local group, the high school students, and the college students pooled their money, their talents, their resources, their dreams, and they helped to design what will be our next bus shelter that reflects our community values of what they say are connection, diversity, color, and the desire to be bold in all that we do. It hasn't been easy. The students have, it's taken a long time. They've faced difficulty, sometimes discouragement. They've had lots of small wins. But what they have said is that they have found a welcoming spirit in this community. That when they bring this issue to the attention of folks, people are eager to help them out. That's a great lesson. But they've learned more. And in fact, they said there's three lessons that they, they want to share. And they think that these lessons are important for more and better community conversations. Lessons that they will take with them throughout their lives, not just for bus benches and shelters, but for anything that they want to do. And they think that it would be good for you to know them too. And the first one is, of course, to learn about an issue about which you feel is important. There are so many things happening in the world, as the young student said early on in my class. Take any one of them that's important to you and work on it. They said, go out, read the newspaper, cruise the internet, ask questions, talk to city officials, and ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Why is it the way it is? If we want our community to be different, let's talk about it. The second thing they said is, join with others and invite more in with you. And express yourself. Be creative in all that you do. Like the one young high school girl who early on in this process said, I know, she was talking to a, a city official, she said, I know there's not enough room at all the bus stops for a bench and the clearance that's required, but what about having like a plate, a seat that would fold up when not in use on a telephone pole and hinge down so that someone could sit when they needed to wait for the bus? And third, they said, don't stop, keep going, be persistent, and let everybody know that your conversation will continue. That student in the back of the room at the end of the semester, I said, so what did you learn? She was reflecting back on her experiences and she said, you know, we had some very rich conversations. We went in and worked with the high school students and we encouraged them to speak, and they did. We loved their ideas, and we, along the way, we created change. We knew and talked about a problem that we saw in our city, and we're getting more bus benches. We're getting it done. Well, the rest of the students are packing up, ready to, you know, it's the end of the semester, they're ready to go. And I said, wait, 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 wait before you go, <laughs> what are the conversations we still need to have in our community? What are the ones we haven't had? Maybe the ones that are that we're afraid to have, that are difficult. And they said, well, um, there's a lot of conversations. And among them was, what about having conversation about the need for joyful education in the arts, in the sciences, in all disciplines, rather than standardized, paced curriculum? 
And what about having conversations about meaningful work and fair pay that would bring value for all instead of profit for a few? They said, are we ready to have deeper conversations about sustainability and programs for peace where we rely on collaboration much more than competition and on connections instead of consumption for our well-being? And they said, how about the conversation about our fundamental freedoms to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Freedoms that are made possible by, but also endangered by, technology and the human touch. You see, the conversation about bus benches and shelters may have been small, but those conversations lead to big results and bigger ideas and bigger conversations. What are the conversations that you think that you can imagine would make our community better? For me, for my students, for everyone really, I think the task at hand is to make the world better. It's just that oftentimes people don't know where to begin. And I say, conversation is the starting point. Woo!